Newton's vision of modern and ancient analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to have the opportunity to deliver this talk in such a wonderful environment as Paris. So, to begin with, I'm going to start with uh, the following chronology as instances of a problem. And after that, I would mention the problem explicitly. So, I'm going to start with few, a few words uh, by Newton. Most of them were not published in his lifetime. So, the first one is the enumeration of curves of three dimensions, which uh, was written in this period here and <coughs> would appear as the enumeratio, uh, the enumeration of curved lines of third order as an appendix to his optics in 1704. Next, we find the letter from Newton to Collins, written in August 1672. After that, uh, the simple locus problems, which forms a part of the well-known waste book, uh, which spans a period between the early six, uh, the mid 1660s until late uh, 1670s. Uh, in this book, Newton wrote uh, a huge plethora of problems and related issues. After that, there's the restoration of the ancient solid low side uh, from the late 70s the known solution of the Asian's problem of solid locus, late 1672. Uh, after that comes something we saw already in the lecture given by Carlos Alvarez, which is the lecture three to eight from the lecture from algebra from the 16, it, it, this has a, a precise date, which is 1680. Finally, the motu corporum, which is an attestant to the Principia from 1687, and last but not least, the finding of Parisians, which <coughs> was written in the early 1680s. Okay. But the electrophysical are not the version? Yes, uh, well. These are the lectures on algebra that Newton was supposed to deliver at the administration of the Trinity College. Exactly, but not lectures that he gave much earlier. Much earlier? Yes. Yes, but here I am using the datation given by Whiteside for the lectures 3 to 8. For the writing of okay. Yeah. So, what we see here, before I state the problem, I mean interested in, is the fact that from as earlier or as the, the, 60s, the 60s of the 7th century until the 90s of the same century, Newton was concerned about certain problem which became recurrent in his scientific work and what is this problem? Well, if you read the abstract, the problem is on what condition or conditions you may say that a kind is given. And this recurrent question, in some sense, appro uh, his approach and this approach itself shaped his work. And I'm not sure that um, there is, uh, in the current state of affairs, uh, much attention given to this uh, topic in relation with the history of Newtonian uh, work. Beyond what everyone says about uh, the way that Newton uh, wrote the Principia in a geometrical form instead, instead of the 
more uh, easy way of the calculus in which the discoveries of Newton in the Principia are taught today. So, that being said, I come to the problem 54 from the third lecture. I'm, gonna pre I'm going to present you three instances of the aforementioned chronology, and I would like to discuss and draw some conclusions toward the end of the talk. So, in this journey, the first example is to describe a parabola which shall pass through four given points. As we all know, uh, a conic is given once we have five <coughs> points given in general position. So here Newton is saying, I'm going to give you four points, but I'm giving you the symptom, the species of a conic, in this case a parabola. So, I'm not going into the details, I know that we are not all mathematicians in this room, so I'm going to give a very general overview of this. If you want, we can discuss the details later. So, the, the, the thing is that He's assuming, as I, as I told you, we have four given points. I need one more point to consider the conic as given. So he's assuming there's a fifth point to be on the parabola. And after some drawings, Newton says, OK, now we assume any defining equation of the parabola to express the relationship between this segment, this segment, AP, which equals X, and PQ, which equals Y. And this defining equation of the parabola expresses the relationship between these two, AP and PQ. And he says, let this equation, this defining equation, be, for instance, this one here. So what is Newton up to? Well, he says all of the coefficients in this equation are given, and he and here we recollect the language of the given as stated by Euclid in the book of the data uh, and restated by Pathus on the mathematical collection, which is the starting point of the treasure of analysis in the book seven of the mathematical collection, as Carlos Alvarez told us earlier. So, after some magical algebra in between, the equation becomes this one, where f, which has not appeared earlier, is this expression here, and a, this coefficient here, is the distance or the segment AB, remember A and B were points given, AC is B, also C was given, AG, GD, RC, and D. So Newton asserts that once this F here in terms of the given data is found, the equation of the parabola is completely determined. But correspondingly, by its construction, and, and, and here comes an inter an interest aspect of, of the discussion relating history to philosophy, Newton makes a, a very sharp distinction, sharp but also subtle, in terms of what it means to the, the canic to be determined by its equation and what it means that the parabola be determined by its construction. So its construction, Newton says, is affected in the following manner. And I'm not going into the details because here we have a drawing with the given point, A, 
there is B, there is C, and there is D. So, as I told you, Newton assumes a fifth point to be on the parabola, this is Q, and draws two axes, which is AC, which turns out to be X, and uh, a parallel line to segment, to the given segment AB, which turns out to be Y. So with this seg segment as axis, Newton works this equation out, and he discovers and, and tells us that all the coefficients are expressible in terms of the given data. Yes? Did Newton take for granted that this is the equation of the parabola? Is yes. Or, or it it? No, no, no. He took it for granted, and actually he's following what Descartes told us in the geometry. So he took it for granted. Yeah. So, um, well, this is the first instance of the problem of upon what conditions the mechanic is given. So here we have the opportunity to witness the clear interrelation between two aspects that were uh, pointed out in the earlier talk by Alvarez, which is the, the, the geometry itself, which is present in all these constructions uh, in which Newton is constructing the parabola and also Newton says he's constructing the equation. I, I want to be emphatic on this last aspect because I'm going to come over it later on. And he also is using algebra as a way to determine the type of mechanic. So the, there's this relationship pretty close to the Cartesian spirit of relating algebra on the one side and geometry on the other side so they can mutually help each other. So actually, when, when Newton says this is the construction of the equation, he ends saying that we have this proportion and V, which is the vertex of the parabola, B, which turns out to be the diameter, and this expression here, the lattice rectum, <coughs> points out in the direction of Apollonius Canics, actually the first book. So this aspect uh, here, present here in this slide, will be interesting later on. Our following instance is in this manuscript, never published in Newton's lifetime from the late 1670s, which is proposition number five. And in here, we have the following. If between two given points A and P of any kind, there be inscribed in any parallelogram AQPS and its two sides AQ, AS, be extended till they meet the curve in B and C, and subsequently from those points B and C to any fifth one, once again, we are aware of the condition that five given points determine uniquely, uniquely a kind. Uh, meet these opposite sides, PS, PQ, in T, on R, then, and this is the conclusion that Newton is going to draw from all, all this uh, text, PR will be to PT always in a given ratio. And more interesting is that conversely, if with all this recipe, PR to PT be in a given ratio, the point D will belong to a conic passing through the four given points, A, B, P, and C. 
I'm not going into the proof which Newton details in this text. You may find it in the mathematical papers predicted by Whiteside. The key ingredient is, once again, Apollonius Conics, the third book, Proposition 17 and 80. So here we have a given conic, take it for granted, and we have a parallelogram A, P, Q, and S with, with two of its vertices on the given conic. We produce this side until it cuts the conic in Z. We produce this side until it cuts the conic in B. And now what we have is if you take any point in any fifth point D on the conic and join CD, BD and produce this until they reach the opposite sides of this parallelogram here in BT on T and C, CP, CD sorry, on R, we get this line RT. And Newton is telling us that this line PR is to this line PT on a given ratio, which amounts the same to say that if we, took, if we take another point on the conic, let's say B1, and do the very same construction, we join CD1, BD1, obtain intersections R1 and T1, the segment R1, T1 is parallel to the segment RT, which is the same to say that all we get here and here is a family of triangles, all these lines being parallel. Uh, uh, sorry, what is like the PZ, the, the property of the Alpha, the dominant, the ellipse, or the dominant cone? Yeah, the, the cone. Uh, the cone, okay. Yeah, he states it in general, although this is the very drawing we have in, in Newton's... Okay, okay, okay. ...for any given conic. Okay. So, this is interesting, uh, but... Uh, yeah, because, for instance, both an ellipse and a hyperbola admits the fact that you can put a parallelogram in here, but not so for the case of the parabola. It's inscribed, you can. Okay, yes, you can. It's inscribed. It's, it's, it's inscribed, yeah. Sorry, my mistake, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking in the following instance of this problem, sorry. So, yeah, you can in any given conic. And the thing is that uh, this thing maybe I wrote it a little bit tighter than usual, will become the most useful and defining property of a conic for Newton. Because, as we see in the statements of the proposition number five, this is an if and only if. So, you might as well characterize a conic in terms of this homographic property. And in a more modern language, we can notice immediately that the line pencil C of R, B of T, we have line pencils on C and on B have equal cross ratio. Actually, if we take the cross ratio for the line pencil, this turns out to be the cross ratio of the corresponding points along this line and this turns out to be the same cross ratio of the corresponding points on this line which turns to be the same curve ratio of the line pencil based on B. So, I just said that in more modern language, we can state 
pretty much the same property in terms of cross ratio for line, pens for line pencils. But the question, both mathematically and historically interest, is was Newton aware of this property? Well, Newton himself proves in proposition number 12 of this same manuscript that if line pencils CR, BT, mark out corresponding range of points, R prime, T prime, on any fixed lines, P, Q prime, and P, S prime through P, pretty much like here, of which this slide become a very particular instance. Therefore, these ranges will be in one-to-one -one correspondence, and related quadruples of points will have equal ratios. This is the general case of what Newton actually proved, states and proves in this proposition. So, in <coughs> some sense, if you want to walk out of these lectures with one particular, uh, infor uh, particular interesting information to, to, to have a discussion subject over coffee later on, the thing is, Newton, in a sense, was a visionary of projective geometry. In this case, he is well aware of this property of line pencils. That is already clear by the numeratio. Yeah, but nevertheless, the, num the numeratio is much more written without showing the trails of the analysis here. Yeah. So, in this la last case, Newton says that these ranges, R prime, T prime, mutually determine one another by simple geometry. Well, I, I don't know, how much time do I have left? Okay. Well, fine. The last instance uh, is the following. The finding of the purism. Uh, uh, this is a text uh, from early 1690s, and a purism uh, was a word, purism was a word already mentioned by Carlos earlier this morning, and Newton state this as uh, purism. <coughs> purism number two. If you want to uh, take this and substitute uh, theorem or proposition, <coughs> please, please do, be my guest. The thing is that in here, we have any circle or conic GCH touched <coughs> by three straight lines these are tangents AG, AH, and BCD. Uh, BCD, uh, these lines touch the conic in these three points, G, H, C, and two of them, AG and AH, are given in position. Meanwhile, the third BD remains mobile. For the resolution, and this is Newton himself talking, of some problem, the result the simplest relationship of the, line, the lines AB, AD. We have this. This is also the drawing that Newton attaches to prism number two, as presented by Whiteside on the mathematical papers. We have this conic, take it for granted. We have three tangents, AH, AG, and BCD. These two are fixed, but the third one, BCD, is mobile, with the sole condition that the point C stays on the conic. So, the thing is that since the ranges of points B, D, mutually determine each other by simple geometry, 
we had that these cross ratios are the same, and we may conclude with Newton this thing, which is mathematically correct. We need a little bit of algebra in here to deliver this conclusion, but nothing that you can't work out from these things already stated by Newton. But the thing is that this last condition doesn't throw any light upon why this is so. So, both a few remarks on reasons and on this last uh, instance of our problem tells us that Newton actually developed a whole set of rules and theorems to deal with direct and inverse proportions another relationship of unknown quantities regarding the determination of low side or the resolution of a problem. And this comes pretty much in uh, the same spirit of the lecture by Carlos in which in order to deal, as Marco said, with uh, metrical problems relating geometrical constructions, we are using, might as well, a uh, projective setting, might as well, a uh, metrical one. But the thing, the, the, the key ingredient relating them is this use of direct and inverse proportions. This determination of loci is what in a certain relaxed sense, Newton referred to as a porism. So he dealt with this porism not only as particular examples on how to apply the formal rules, but as genuine investigations on problems now la la labeled as projective geometry, which was something already you said during the coffee break. He's using projective arguments, but he's using the language of direct and inverse proportion as a substitute to metrical projective geometry. So, Newton tells, tells us in this unpublished text that the geometrical analysis of the ancients, for geometry in its entirety, it's nothing else than defining of points by the intersection of loci. So, Newton, thanks to the problem of upon what condition a conic is given, travels a long way from, let me use this terminology, from a Cartesian point of view towards a more projective point of view guided by this problem of a conic. Even when it comes to the most famous of Newton's work, which is the Principia, which many, many says, why is the Principia written in the language of geometry and not in the language of calculus? Well, his investigations will relating to geometry, and in particular, the geometry of conics, lead him into the use of this language as a more proficient tool than the Cartesian toolbox for the delivery of his results. This is work in progress, uh, along with uh, my, my colleague and friend, Carlos Alvarez, and for the time being, thank you very much. Okay.